I love the history and the tradition of the Sydney Cricket Ground. When I'm fielding in the gully or down at third man, I love looking back at those famous old stands. Being in the dressing rooms, taking a snapshot in my mind, thinking of all the great players to have shared this sacred place. Growing up in Perth, I always looked up to Rodney Marsh and Dennis Lilly. Them being from Western Australia. But Alan Border, he was my hero. I remember watching him dominate a Boxing Day test. Being over in Perth, the day's play is done and dusted by three in the afternoon. And this day, Dave and I barreled straight out into the backyard for a game. I hit the ball over the fence because he put the ball in the best place for me to hit it hard. And that is there, so I can just go like that. That was the first time I ever played left-handed, to be like AB. The first time I remember never wanting to give my wicket away, to be as determined as the great man. Summer in Australia, it's all about holidays and barbecues. And most of all, it's about cricket. The greatest time of year, a celebration. I remember the day Kerry Packer died, the one and only. How his legacy had made our lives as cricketers so much better wearing black armbands at the anthems and then going out and digging in for a last gasp Australia victory. A hundred for Michael Hussey and a magnificent hundred it is too. A century with Pigeon down the other end. There it is, wonderful victory, wonderful innings. There goes Michael Hussey. Those winning runs in amazing Adelaide as we roll towards a 5 0 whitewash of the Ashes the following summer. That was special. I've never liked the attention though, never liked the fanfare, or the tag, Mr Cricket. 17 test match hundreds for Mr Cricket. I guess what I don't like about it is, I know there are many greater players than me. I know there's cricketers out there who know more about the game. Only thing is, I'm not sure anyone could love it more than me. Get in there. Were down, and that's when it really matters. My motivation and drive pro probably just came from the love of the game, really. I really enjoyed training. I, I enjoyed, uh, you know, hitting lots of balls and working on my game. And I was quite a limited player as, as a youngster, quite small and quite weak. And um, so I had a lot to work on and, and lots of scope for improvement. So. I loved working on all aspects of my game as well, whether it be the, uh, the you know the technical side of things, but but also the fitness side of things, the strength, the mental side of the game, which I think is really important as well. So, you know, there's lots of different uh, things that I, I I really wanted to work on. I debuted for WA when I was 19 years of age, um, uh, one game in 1994, uh, and, and I only had the one game for that season. It was through injury to uh, Mike Valletta. Um, so I got a taste of it, you know, playing with guys like Tom Moody and um, Damian Martin, uh, Adam Gilchrist, Brad Hogg, you know, and um, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that one opportunity, um, but I had to wait until the following year to, to actually start in the team sort of full time. My first four or five seasons for Western Australia, I felt like I'd performed quite well, but I, I couldn't get an, uh, an opportunity to play for Australia. There were just so many good players and they were all performing so well that the Australian team was hardly changing. Um, so I decided to try and change my game and, and I put more pressure on myself. I trained even harder and uh, it, you know, it sort of had a detrimental effect on my game a little bit. You know, I put so much pressure on myself and tried so hard. I ended up you know, performing very inconsistently for WA uh, after the, the, you know, that sort of good start to my career and uh, culminatingly uh, getting dropped from the Western Australian team. And, and that was the point where I thought, oh well, my chance of playing for Australia is gone. I can't even get a game for Western Australia. Um, you know, you know, I'm never going to play for Australia. And, and in a way, it was a bit of a blessing because I decided to come into the following season and just think, well, stuff it. I'm not going to worry about playing for Australia anymore. I'm just going to relax, go back to playing my way, go back to enjoying the game, enjoying my teammates' success. And, you know, you can still be proud that you can play first-class cricket for Western Australia and, uh, you know, and, and have a career like that. And as soon as I took that pressure off myself and tried to relax more and, and enjoy my game and, and play, play the way that I'd always played, then 
that's when I started performing more consistently again. And, and funny enough, that's when I got my opportunity to play for Australia. My letter to Steve War again, it's a little bit embarrassing, I guess, <laughs> when I think about it now, but um, Queensland was one team in Shield cricket that I always struggled with. You know, that they were such a good team. And Western Australia, we had a great rivalry with them. I, I think for a, a four or five year period, we were always sort of fighting for the Sheffield Shield and, and um, we had some great battles. And, you know, I, I personally, always struggled to score runs against Queensland that you know they were very good at getting under your skin you know they just they, they weren't nasty in what they said but you know they, they would just chirp away at you quietly and um, and they really made you or well, they made me angry you know and and they made me feel like I was inferior and that I didn't deserve to be on the same field as them and and, and they did it brilliantly and um, I remember again getting out cheaply at the Gabba and, and being so disappointed because it was the you know I felt like to maybe be an Australian player, I had to perform against the best, and Queensland were the best. So I failed again against Queensland, and I thought, oh, I'm, not, I'm not good enough, you know? I'm not good enough against the best players in Australia, so how am I supposed to be good enough to play for Australia? And I remember sitting in the, in the dressing room um, at the Gabba, and I was so disappointed, you know, and, and I just started writing to Steve Warren, and, and, um, cause, because I, I thought I wasn't mentally tough enough. I couldn't mentally handle what the Queenslanders were giving to, to me out, out there in the middle. So I started, I, I thought, who was the men, most mentally tough player in the Australian team? And, and the name that sprung to my mind was Steve Waugh. So I started just drafting this letter to him and saying, you know, how can I become more mentally tough? You know, I've, I've struggled with Queensland. They get under my skin every time. I can't score runs against them. They, they get my mind off the game. And, and as I was writing this letter, it was just starting to, you know, come to me. You know, the answers were coming to me as I was writing the letter. It was like, you know, they're trying to put you off the game. They're, you know, they're distracting you. What, what's important? You know, you've just got to concentrate on your preparation. You've got to concentrate on your routine out in the middle. You've got to concentrate on the ball. That's, that's all you need to concentrate on. They're, they're doing it very well by taking your mind off the game. And all the answers started coming to me in my mind. So as I was writing the letter, I was getting the answers at the same time. And so I got to the end and, and I actually was too, too embarrassed to, to send the letter in the end, but it was still a good exercise because it confirmed in my mind and, and got me thinking, okay, what are the most important things and what do I need to concentrate on rather than getting uh, distracted by all these, again, external distractions. I was lucky enough to go on an Australia A tour to Scotland and Ireland. Um, we had some great players and uh, we had a great coach. It was my idol in AB and um, we, we were training before a game against Scotland and uh, the bowlers only wanted to bowl, you know, five or ten or fifteen or twenty balls each and then they, they wanted to get off the track and, and have a rest. And the batters seemed to only face, you know, bowlers for, you know, five or ten minutes and they wanted to be fresh for the game the next day. And, and AB wasn't happy with this. You know, he's sort of saying, you know, who do you guys think you are? Um, how do you expect to be in the field all day, bowl all day? How do, as batsmen, how do you expect to bat all day when you're only bat for five or ten minutes in the nets? And bowlers, you know, you've got to bowl 15, 20 overs in a day. How do you, you know, how do you expect to get through that when you're only, you know, happy to bowl 15 or 20 balls in the nets? You know, if you want to, if you want to bat all day, you've got to learn to bat all day. And um, it got me thinking uh, about it. And uh, you know, once I'd come back to Australia, and uh, I was, you know, um, I was meant to be playing grade cricket on a Saturday, and my team had a bye, and I was really keen to play. Um, so I got um, my batting coach, and uh, Ian Kevin, and uh, I said, right, come on, we've got the bye today, we'll, we'll, go, to, we'll go to the nets and um, we'll, we'll do a day's play worth of batting. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing to talk about now, but um, I, I loved it at the time. We, we started at 11 o'clock, we did a two hour session. He was doing, you know, we did a lot of underarm drills and uh, he sort of threw me balls over arm and we got on the bowling machine and, and you know, we're just batting away. And then we had a lunch break from 11 to, uh, uh, sorry, from one till you know one forty, and then, then we'd start again, and we'd, we'd work through the, the middle session, you know, um, one forty through to three forty. Have another twenty minute break for tea, and then um, we we sort of you know finished off the day. And and I must admit, by by the end of it, I was exhausted because you know if you're on the bowling machine, you, you're facing a lot more balls than you would in a, in a match, because you've got time in between balls and things like that. And I remember being yeah absolutely shattered by the end of it. But it was a great exercise. One, you're teaching yourself to bat long, long periods of time, but I was also grooving all my shots. You know, I played every single shot about a million times that day, and I was just training my body to do it automatically. And um, yeah, as I said, it is a little bit embarrassing to talk about it, but I, I think it was, it, it was a good exercise, not to do every week, but I mean, you know, once off, just to try and train your body to, to play all the shots. 
So my test call up uh, came in November 2005 uh, against the West Indies. Um, well, I'd, I'd actually just come home from a game from Western Australia. We'd been in Victoria for a one-day match, and um, we we lost the match. We got absolutely smashed by the Vicks. Um, but Justin Langer got hit in the ribs, um, and uh, he had to come off uh, retired hurt in that match. But anyway, after that match had finished, the Test players, Justin being one of them, went up to Brisbane to prepare for the first Test of the summer, and the Western Australian boys, which I was part of, flew back to Perth. And I'd, I'd been for a nice long walk along the beach um, with my wife Amy, and uh, we had a, a, a new baby daughter at that stage. And um, I remember getting back into the car and uh, the phone rang. Uh, Huss, it's Trevor Hones here. Um, how quickly can you get to Brisbane? Um, we need you on standby for Justin Langer. And I was like, mate, I'll be there in <laughs> half an hour. And he goes, yep, great, get on the next available plane. So I raced home, packed whatever I could, raced straight to the airport. And um, within an hour, I was pretty much at the airport ready to go and um, I felt like a rock star actually. You know, there was cameras everywhere and you know, flashes were going off and got off to a pretty ordinary start. Um, as I lifted my suitcase up onto the, the conveyor belt to get weighed, you know, the zip broke and, and clothes just went absolutely everywhere <laughs> in front of the whole world, you know, it, was, it wasn't a great start. But I remember once I got to the, um, met up with the Australian team, that they were absolutely fantastic. You know, there were some big, big names in that team, got, you know, Ponting and Hayden, Warren, McGrath, um, Gilchrist, obviously I knew from, from WA and, and um, you know, they made me feel like I deserved to be there, welcome, part of the team right from the word go and that, that was a big boost. I was still just on standby for Justin Langer who, who had a, a busted rib and um, I remember going over to JL and saying, you know, how you going, mate? He goes, mate, waste of time you being here, you know, um, I'll be fine, I'm going to be fine for the test match, don't, you know, you don't even have to be here. And knowing JL, he's a tough nut. <laughs> I, I pretty much took that as, as gospel, really. But I, I thought I'd go over and speak to the physio as well and just sort of get a bit of an idea from him. And uh, I sort of said, you know, how's he going? He goes, no, I'd be preparing to play if I were you. He's really struggling, you know. And I was like, oh, OK, so I'm getting two, two sides of the stories here. But I remember coming to training and preparing with the team. And um, that, that was you know, great as well, you know, we always get best facilities, the guys prepare so well for every every test match or every game they play for Australia. So just, I remember being at training and just watching Justin like a hawk, you know, looking for any sign of weakness or a grimace or, you know, something and, and he, he sort of didn't do too much in the fielding side of things, and but he got through okay and then, and then I watched him bat in the nets and um, he was batting before me and he batted beautifully. He was smashing them everywhere, you know, and uh, I thought, you know, I had that sinking feeling in my stomach, you know, I've missed my chance, you know, and I was a bit disappointed, really, you know. <laughs> and then Justin was coming out of the nets and I was walking into the nets and he just pulled me aside and he said, Huss, just want to let you know um, I'm out, um, you're in, good luck. And that's all he said. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I'm going to play a test. And I think my first five balls I got out four times in the nets. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I just couldn't believe it. And I just then remember thinking to myself, right, you're playing a test, you know, let's get on preparing, let's start preparing for a test match. And so, you know, I started concentrating on what I had to do. And to be honest, when my first test match came around, I was an emotional wreck. <laughs> and I, I, I'll be the first to admit, I didn't handle the emotions very well at all. Because um, it's such a long journey, you know, to, to receive your baggy green cap, it's a great honour. Bill Brown, uh, who at the time was the oldest living Australian test player, uh, presented me with my cap. Um, it's a
race down um, to the boundary for four and and then yeah that pure emotion just started pouring out again. <laughs> When I said after my first test match, I had that burning desire inside that I, I wanted to prove to myself and, and to the whole world that I could succeed at that level, and, th and that was the moment that I thought, "Wow, I, I can, I can do it. You know, I, c I can succeed at test match level." And I, I remember, you know, I hate looking back at the footage, you know, and seeing that moment because you carried on like a pork chop. <laughs> I guess that's what happens when you've got to wait so long before you actually play test cricket. All that uh, pent-up emotion just uh, let out there by Michael Hussey. It was just pure emotion just pouring out of me. And, and I remember what was really nice for me is someone of the experience and someone that I really admired and looked up to so much at the other end was Matty Hayden. And he, was, he just had pure delight for me, you know, in his face. And, and that really meant a lot to me. Um, uh, just seeing how happy my success was that, that was making him happy that that really gave me a great feeling and um, and yeah it was yeah phenomenal phenomenal day and it's it's certainly a, a memory that I'll, I'll, I'll take to my grave <laughs> uh, Mr Cricket yes that started in England um, I was playing county cricket for Durham and we were playing a game at Old Trafford against um, Lancashire and um, uh, Brad Hodge was the overseas player for Lancashire and uh, Freddie Flintoff was playing and James Anderson and it was a cold, wet, miserable day. No one really wanted to be there except for me. I was loving it, you know, I was, uh, I was in there batting and charging between the wickets and wanted to be out there and, and uh, Freddie Flintoff turned to Brad Hodge and said, Phew, this guy loves cricket more than anyone I know. He, he must be Mr Cricket and, and Hodgie found it pretty funny and then he passed it on to Andrew Simons and passed on to someone else and unfortunately uh, <laughs> it did stuck and uh, yeah, I've had to live with it ever since. <laughs> Nothing can actually really prepare you for international cricket than actually just getting in there. You know, um, I, I wasn't prepared for the amount of scrutiny and, and the amount of extra attention and the, and the amount of media and the amount of um, you know, fans and things like that that are, that are all watching you and, and uh, analysing your game. You know, you, you can't prepare for that until you actually get there. But, but where I was very lucky is that I was very comfortable with my game. So, and, and I was comfortable with my preparation. Uh, I'd done a lot of work over 10 years of first class cricket. I'd been to England and played a lot of county cricket as well. So I'd learned a lot about the game and I'd learned a lot about myself and I'd learned a lot about batting. So when I got into international cricket, I had to deal with all the external distractions, which was tough, but I knew that I had a very good base to my game and I knew I had a lot a lot of cricket behind me so I just knew if I just stick to my preparation stick to I knew what know what works for me then that gives me the best chance you know of performing at, at you know the highest level um, but yeah it still took me time to you know uh, to, to sort of learn how to deal with all the other stuff as well. I remember playing uh, my first Boxing Day test against South Africa and South Africa you know throughout my career have always been a very good team. For me a Boxing Day test and a hundred in a Boxing Day test was it often motivated me when I was halfway or three quarters away up a, up a sand hill. You know, it was like, come on, do this, do this for a, for a Boxing Day test. And, and quite often, I'd go out and train on a Christmas day because I knew no one else in the world would be training on that day. And and I felt like it gave me like you know, I'm getting ahead of my opponent sort of things. And and I remember, you know, running up a hill and doing it tough on a Christmas day and thinking, um, this is for a Boxing Day test hundred. And and suddenly. I'm at the MCG playing in a Boxing Day test and, and it was a great feeling. Um, and I wanted to soak it in. But unfortunately, when you're in the middle of a cauldron of, of a test match, you don't have time to sort of sit back and smile and relax. You've got this ball coming down at 150 k's an hour and they're trying to get you out. And, and I remember um, I was batting after Brad Hodge and uh, it was after tea time and uh, we lost a wicket and Brad Hodge was walking out the bat and, and I remember just lying in the, um, in the viewing area and just watching the game on TV and I, I actually almost nodded off. Um, uh, we lost the wicket, Brad Hodge is walking out the bat, local Victorian player. The roar of that Melbourne crowd was phenomenal. <laughs> Uh, 
I jumped up out of my slumber and uh, I just felt this whirl of adrenaline uh, hearing, I, I thought the roof was going to come off, you know, as Brad Hodge walked out to bat. So I'm getting my pads on and getting ready and um, unfortunately Hodgie didn't last too long and I, and I was pretty much walking out um, you know, soon after. And um, it was an amazing atmosphere. Yeah, we forget how inexperienced he is in this atmosphere too. He's played the MCG plenty of times, but not in front of this many. And, and it was everything I'd ever dreamed of. Unfortunately, the South Africans had a, a good patch and we were seriously under the pump. I think we lost about four wickets late in the day and um, we were under enormous pressure. I, I managed to sort of survive through that night and um, I, I, I can't remember how many I was, but it would have been say 20, 20 odd runs you know, overnight. And we were in a bit of a precarious position. I think we were eight down overnight for about 230, 240 at that stage. Early the next day, yes. McGill gets bowled pretty much straight away. So we're nine down, uh, McGrath comes to the crease. Ricky Ponding's not too disappointed with that score. 250, not bad, but he needs some runs out of McGrath and Hussey now. In, in one way, it's, it's nothing to lose because whatever runs you can get are a bonus. Um, and so that was pretty much how he sort of played it. That one's gone, two second slip and onto the deck. There's never a good time to drop catches. Maybe this might be one of the bad ones. McGrath was pretty determined. He, he sort of said, right, let's, let's annoy these guys for as long as we can. Beautiful defence. You try and take, you know, four balls at the over and, um, and then I'll try and survive, and then you get a single and then I'll try and survive the last, last ball or the last two balls. And that, that was pretty much our plan. Charge, good shot, over cover, good use of the feet. Beautifully played by Michael Hussey. This guy doesn't just bat and make runs, he uses his head as well. The thinking cricketer. Well played, the old dead bat. Nine for 264. And we had to play a bit of cat and mouse with Graham Smith. He was moving the field sort of back for me and, and I'd sort of face a few balls out. And then he'd bring the field in and I'd try and hit a four and, and then get a quick single to, to you know, get on strike for the following over. And, and we tried to do this for as long as we possibly could. It was hard to grab by a mile. Good running by the big man. One, it was getting me on strike as much as possible. But two, it was trying to grow our scores as much as we possibly could as well. Bang, big hit, strong hit, well hit. Brings up 50, very handy middle order batsman. And I remember sort of being out there and we were annoying the South Africans so much because McGrath was resolute and showed so much character and so much courage really um, to hang in there for so long. And I remember thinking, how much fun is this? <laughs> it's gone for, oh, it's McGrath, puts him down. Could be a run out, he's back safe. They could go now, no they don't. Here's the throw. Oh, it's all happening and it's a duck ball. The over bowl, 277 for nine. I'm batting with Glenn McGrath. It doesn't even matter if I get out, you know, it's whatever runs we can get are a bonus. It's like playing in the backyard, you know, uh, on, on a Christmas day. You just go out there and have a good time and relax. And this is the biggest test match in the world, playing with no fear. Well, down the wicket he goes again, and that one's over the top as well. That one's sailing away down in the same direction. What a shot from Hussey, another six. So I was charging and swinging and balls were flying, nicking over the slips and then you'd connect with one and um, it was just so much fun. There are plenty of opportunities to save the single with two balls of the over left, but equally some floaters in the deep if uh, Hussey goes big. That's brilliant. Now that is a fantastic bit of batting. Well, this is batting with the tail at its absolute best. I even started getting confident and McGrath tried to play a big shot and I'd go down and tell him off and say, Oi, you know, no shots, you know, McGrath. And, and then I'd walk back to the bowler's end and think, just tell Glenn McGrath off. What are you doing, you know? <laughs> you can't tell Glenn McGrath off. So it was, it was a really um, memorable experience. And um, our confidence grew. The longer we went and the more I backed McGrath, uh, um, you know, the, the better we sort of went. And, and they were getting so frustrated out there as well. The, the cat and mouse was what I was really concentrating on. And the single is stolen. It wasn't so much about getting to 100 or getting to 350 as a team. It was just, it was, yeah, pretty much just in the moment and, and in the situation of the game. How, how, do, I, how do I manipulate the situation? And uh, you need support from a good partner as well. And, and, and Glenn certainly showed me a lot of support. Uh, a lot of courage and a lot of application at the other end. You know, it's certainly a partnership. Four balls bowled in the over, so there's two remaining 
No real change in the field, though. Still offering the one to Mike Hussey. Mid on, mid off, back. Mid wicket, back. Man at deep back with square. That's a wonderful strike. And it's very big, too. Oh, this is some innings from Michael Hussey. That is just talent. Absolute talent. Three runs needed for what will be one of the best hundreds you're ever likely to see. 27 not out when joined by Glenn McGrath. He's made 70. I remember um, getting to 90, uh, 98 and I hit a single down to uh, off the spinner down to deep square leg and, and Bout just sort of said, no Huss, what are you doing? You don't take a single on, you know, to get to 99. McGrath's definitely going to get out now. And um, I didn't even care, you know, I was like, no, we, we, you know, we've done so much more than we ever thought we were going to anyway. We've got ourselves into a reasonable position. We've nearly made 350, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. But then deep down I was thinking, but a hundred on a Boxing Day test would be pretty special. <laughs> Come on, McGrath, please get through. I feel a bit for Glenn McGrath, he has worked so hard out there. And he would absolutely kick himself if he gets out now. He's such a good team player, Glenn McGrath, that he'd want to be there to see Mike Hussey bring up his hand. Two balls to face out. Elegant of leg glances. McGrath does it. The over is survived. Hussey has his opportunity. It's nine for three, two, five. certainly played his part. He hung in there for him, but that's some of the best hitting I've ever seen in Test match cricket. Two sixes over mid off, a one over wide mid on. Just unbelievable straight play. A treat for the crowd and a treat for all the people watching at home. It was also significant because the night before uh, Kerry Pack had passed away and uh, we had a you know um, a minute silence the following day um, and, and that's something that I'm quite proud of as well. One, one to play in a Boxing Day Test, two um, you know, Australia won that test, but three, to be able to score 100, you know, on, on you know, the, the day that sort of Kerry Packer passed away, someone that did so much for, for the game and for the players, um, is something that I'm, you yeah, know, really, really proud of. Yeah, the fist pump, uh, I don't know where it came from, to be honest. I think it's just um, adrenaline. You know, I, and I only started it really when I started playing for Australia. I remember starting... Um, doing it when I played against New Zealand, in New Zealand. It was my very first tour, and um, I was slogging at the end of our innings. We were batting first, and um, I managed to hit the last ball for six. And I remember giving a massive fist pump to the boys, and Daniel Vittori, he gave me a massive spray about it. Said, oh, you think the game's over now, you young upstart, or something like, something along those lines. And um, and I remember thinking, oh, geez, sorry, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing that. And I came in, and um, some of the boys said, oh, we love it, we love the passion, we love the fist pump, you know, and, and so I think it sort of like stuck from there. And so, yeah, when I felt that emotion really come out and that, that adrenaline, you know, I quite often gave it, you know, a big sort of fist pump. And uh, <laughs> yeah, again, it's a bit embarrassing when I think about it now, but, uh, but no, it's good, good fun. Yeah, the Adelaide test in 2006 against England was, uh, it was just amazing. You know, I, I've heard a lot of people call it amazing Adelaide, you know, and, um, yeah, it was, oh, I could talk about it all day. <laughs> but yeah, e England bounced back after the first test loss up at the Gabba and, and they piled on 550 on a typical belter at, at Adelaide, you know, brilliant batting pitch. And um, I remember being exhausted, to be honest. They batted for nearly two days and uh, the bowlers had stuck to their task pretty well. It was a very good batting pitch. Peterson batted very well and, um, and uh, Collingwood made a big score as well. But the one thing that stood in my mind was it, it's taken them almost two days to get to 550. So, so that, that's good. You know, they haven't scored too quickly that they've given themselves more time to, to win the test match. So if we can bat reasonably well in our first innings, I reckon we're a good chance of saving the test and drawing this test match and staying 1-0 ahead in the series. That, that was my thinking. Um, Coming out to bat in the first innings, we were in a bit of trouble. I think we'd lost three three early wickets and uh, we needed a partnership. And, and thankfully, Ricky, who's probably my favourite batsman to bat with, you know, out of everyone I've batted with in, in the world, 
he's so good to bat with because he's so confident, you know, and um, he scores so quickly. He scores to all areas of the ground that he takes pressure off you. You can just concentrate on just hanging in there, doing your thing, because you know Ricky's going to keep the scoreboard ticking over at the other end. And plus, he's very confident to talk to in the middle as well. Uh, he, he's always been positive. He's always, you know, pepping you up. He's always trying to build the partnership, keep the partnership going, and and keeps you focused, I guess. So. I really enjoyed batting with Ricky, and, and you know, particularly on that day, he, he was in the best, probably the best form I've ever seen him in. He made a massive hundred in the first test. He made another hundred in that in that particular uh, innings as well. We had a really good partnership, and and I remember we we had to bat for long, long, you know, to try and build up our score, and um, we busted our our backsides pretty much the whole day, and and um, I remember getting out. The first or second over of the second new ball, and I, and I was so annoyed. Oh, it's got in! Got the inside edge onto the stumps! Hung at it again! He's the hero for England. Very big quick. Changed his mind, Mike Lassie. He's going to let it go. Didn't get the bat on the road. Jagged it back onto the stumps. Big wickets. I'd worked my backside off all day. I got out for 91. I was desperate to get 100. I was desperate to try and build our score you know, as, as much as we possibly could. And I, it's probably the most annoyed I've ever been, actually. I walked off in Adelaide and I never throw my bat or anything like that, but I remember putting my bat down and I remember started throwing my gloves down and carrying on. And, and in Adelaide, where the viewing area was, was very close to the public. And Ricky came in and said, Huss, quieten down. They, people can hear you out here. Pull your head in. And uh, so I was like, OK, I better quieten down here. <laughs> but I remember that's the, the most annoyed I've ever been. Because I'd worked so hard, all day, and I, I didn't get the big reward of scoring, you know, Ashes 100. Uh, and the team needed another, we needed someone to get 150, 200 to, to get us safe, you know, in that test. But thankfully, Michael Clark batted brilliantly. Um, I think Gilly chipped in, he might have got 60 as well. Warney batted particularly well as well, and, and we managed to get up to around 500. We were about 50 behind on the first, the first innings which I thought, brilliant, you know, we're going to save this test. You know, we've done, we've done enough in the first innings, we should be able to draw this match, no worries. <clears throat> so coming into the second innings, um, England started batting, and uh, it was, you know, by this stage, it's sort of late on the fourth, the fourth day, so there's only one, one day to go. England must have been one for 40 or 50, you know, stumps on day four. So I'm going home that night thinking, drawn test, you know, uh, great, one nil up in the series perfect. Come in the next morning and there was a bit of a funny feeling in the dressing room. Um, Ricky and John Buchanan, the coach, called a team meeting and said, um, right, you guys, how are we going to win this test match? I believe we can win this test match. Um, we've got to figure out the best way to do it. And I was thinking, are you serious? <laughs> um, but Ricky was hell-bent and Shane Warne started getting in on the act as well. Um, and they started to make us believe that we could actually win this test match. We just had to figure out the best way to go about it. So we had this team meeting at the start of day five and um, Ricky said, right, we can either go all out attack, set very attacking fields, go for wickets. We're probably gonna give away a few extra runs, but if we can pick up a couple of wickets, you know, you, know, you never know, we, we might be able to bowl them out and, and chase down whatever. Or the second option, was let's just strangle them. Let's give them no runs. We don't have to be as attacking in the field. Let's just give them no runs. That's just so they, they feel like they can't score, they can't get away from us, and they can't make you know make the game safe. And then if we can just grab one wicket, um, then we might put a bit of pressure on. They might start to feel the pressure, and we can get a bit of a roll on and, and go that way. And, and as a team, we decided to go that way. We were just going to strangle them, starve them of runs, not give them anything. And we were very lucky. We had Shane Warne. <laughs> he bowled two sessions non-stop from one end. And I think I remember him bowling one loose ball in that whole time. And uh, I think he picked up four wickets. I can't remember exactly. But he was a genius. He bowled so well, non-stop, two sessions in a row. And then that enabled us to attack with the quick bowlers from the other end. We got the ball to reverse swing quite a bit. Brett Lee bowled very well. Glenn McGrath picked up the last couple of wickets. Stewie Clark bowled very well. So we were able to rotate the quicks around from one end and then Warney just twirl away at the other end and, uh, and obviously he bowled like a genius. We strangled the, uh, the Englishman. We got a bit of a lucky wicket early with um, Strauss. I think it was an unlucky dismissal. Oh yes, they're holding it up. And I don't, oh yes, he's given it. Oh, he didn't hit that. 
caught by me at short leg. I'm, I'm not sure he got any bat on it, but you know, we took it. <laughs> and then there was a run out. Ian Bell got run out. And you could just start to sense the English were a little bit worried or a little bit under pressure, you know, and um, we could feel it. And we thought that they could feel it as well. Then Peterson comes out and he's the one that can take the game away from us pretty quickly and he can get them into a safe position. He'd made a big score, 150 I think in the first innings. He was confident. Warney bowls him behind his legs for one. Ah! Oh, he's got him, he's bowled him. Wow, that is a huge blow. That was the full one into the rough and he's bowled him around his legs. Now we're really starting to believe that we can actually do this. Got him! Good shot catch! Yes! Oh yes! What a cricketer! Got him! Clean bowling. Oh, there's a shout this time. We need 160 odd off the last 36 overs, and I remember feeling incredibly nervous. So I, I was coming in today thinking it's going to be a drawn test match, pretty casual, a boring old draw, no worries. Suddenly, we're a chance to win. We, we can win this test match. I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, so Justin Langer and, um, and Matty Hayden go out to bat. And JL sets the tone perfectly by smashing the first ball through mid-wicket for four. Sent, it sent us a message saying we, we can do this. It was, it was always going to be tough. Fifth day pitch uh, in Adelaide. It's sort of starting to stay low a bit. It's turning. But it sent them a message as well. We, we think we can win and we're going to take this on positively. We, had, we only had 36 overs to score the run. So there was a bit of, bit of time pressure as well. Um, but we got off to a pretty fast start with JL and, and Matty Hayden. But they both got out going, going for the quick runs. In the air, should be out. Midwicket coming around, got to catch it for England. He does, he does. It's two for 33. I actually came in at number four ahead of Damien Martin in that innings. And, and the reason for it was that Ashley Giles was going to be bowling to the right-handers over the wicket and into the rough. And it was going to be very difficult for the right-handers to rotate the strike and keep the scoreboard ticking over because Anything can happen out of that rough. They can protect that one side of the field. The right-handers are going to find it very difficult to score on the other side. So the plan was to have a left-hand, right-hand combination in at all times. And that would try and nullify the Ashley Giles factor bowling negatively into the rough. So I came out and um, started to build a partnership with Ricky. And, and it worked quite well because I sort of saw it as a, as a one-day match. And I thought, right, okay, what would I do in a one-day game? We, we need uh, 160, 30-odd overs. Okay, got to be positive, but let's be busy. Let's work the ball into the gaps. Let's run hard between the wickets. They'll be feeling the pressure. You might get the odd boundary away. Ricky was in unbelievable touch at that time. So he kept the scoreboard ticking over, and we started to build a bit of confidence. Oh, boy, and these guys are playing so well, too. That is a magnificent shot again from Ponting down the wicket and hitting the ball on the offside, despite the fact that it's spinning in that direction. Unfortunately, Ricky got out on 49, chipped one to cover. Well, they needed that one desperately. That might just make a little bit of a difference. Again, I started to feel nervous and I started to feel the pressure come onto me. But Michael Clark came out and he was pretty tense and pretty pumped up as well. And we started to try and build the partnership again. And as we got closer and closer to the target, I started getting more and more nervous, you know, because I'm thinking, Gonna, we're a chance to win. We can win this. You know, I, I desperately want to be out here. Oh, how good was that? Magnificently placed up the full face of the bat. Soft hands, boundary. Magnificent half century. Having a golden year. What a fine cricketer. He's happy. I remember when we needed five, I managed to pull one off uh, Jimmy Anderson. Oh, there he goes. What a shot. What a cricketer. Punches the air, so he should. And that was the moment when I thought, yes, we are going to do this, we're going to win. And I just remember this emotion just pouring out of me and I was starting to do the fist pumps to the boys up in the, up in the stands. And, and then 
I remember standing there waiting for Jimmy Anderson to bowl that last ball, and and I just wanted him to hurry up and bowl, just just bowl, hurry, hurry, you know. I just wherever it is, I'm just going to hit it and let's just run and let's just get this over with. And um, sure enough, squeezed one through cover and and we'd won this unbelievable Test match. There it is, wonderful victory, wonderful innings. There goes Michael Hussey, pressing the crowd. Australia just too good at the final day. Out bowled them, out batted them. A wonderful all-round team performance. You know, I've seen a lot of subcontinental teams when they win a, a special match. All the players run onto the field and they hug the players, and but that's something in Australia we, we've never really done. You know, we always stay on the side and sort of clap and cheer, and then come out and sort of shake the hands. But the players were starting to run onto the field. You know, I, I, you know, Adam Gilchrist came running down and gave me a big hug and was, you know, uh, fist pumps everywhere. And, and I hadn't seen that from an Australian team. And, and for guys like Ricky and, and Shane Warne to say after so many Test matches, that's probably the best Test match they've ever played. That that. Was, that made me feel pretty good and that made me feel pretty special. Winning the Ashes 5-0 was really special, you know, particularly after the guys had, you know, been defeated in 2005. I, I remember that before the first Test match in Brisbane uh, of that series, um, never been part of an Australian team that was so focused and so determined and single-minded in, in winning back those Ashes. You know, the, the, the guys, particularly the senior guys, you know, guys like Ricky and Shane and, and Glenn McGrath and um, um, uh, Gilly, these guys were hurting so much after 2005. And just that first team meeting we had, I just thought, wow, these guys, nothing is going to get in this team's way. You know, they, they were so determined. And, and the way we played in that series was just awesome. Um, it was just uncompromising. It was just disciplined, tough, hard test match cricket for long, long periods of time. And um, yeah, it was just a privilege to be a part of. And there were so many special memories and moments through that series as well, you know, from winning the you know, test match in Adelaide, going to Perth and, and securing the Ashes in Perth, the retirements of Shane Warne, Shane Warne getting 700 wickets in, in Melbourne in front of his home fans, Glenn McGrath and Justin Langer also retiring after the Sydney test match. And um, just to be able to play with these guys and uh, is such an honour, you know, uh, and to be involved in a, an Ashes series is such an honour. And so I, I still pinch myself today you know, that I've, you know, I was part of that series and, um, um, and just to be able to play with some of those famous names. It was a massive hole, losing uh, Glenn McGrath, Shane Warne and Justin Langer on the same day. I, I remember we were celebrating in, in the dressing rooms afterwards um, and I remember having a chat to Ricky and just saying, oh, this is going to get a lot harder now, isn't it? <laughs> you know, without those three guys, we've still got some great players, no question, but, you know, they, they were just... Their performances were just phenomenal over such a long period of time. But, but also they were very important in the dressing room as well. Justin Langer was the leader of the team song, so um, you know, he was very important culturally you know, in, in setting the fabric of the team and, uh, and, and things like that. Glenn McGrath was, uh, and, and Shane Warne both gave a lot on the field, but they gave so much off the field. You know, I can remember before my first test and um, feeling so nervous. And Shane Warne, he pulled me aside, and I didn't know him very well at this stage. He pulled me aside and said, Huss, um, you don't have anything to prove to anyone in this dressing room. You're good enough to be here, you deserve to be here, just go out there and play your game and you cannot fail. And for someone like Shane Warne to say that to a new player coming into the team, I felt 10 feet tall, I felt like I couldn't fail. Um, so things like that that those guys used to do um, was just so important and, and they gave so much to the team off the field as well. You know, so um, losing that sort of experience and, uh, and, and those personalities was always going to be a huge dent. Justin Langer was the songmaster, and after the fifth test um, against England in Sydney, uh, in that amazing 5-0 um, Ashes win, um, we were celebrating in the dressing room, but um, a boat had been organised to go out on Sydney, uh, Sydney Harbour to continue the celebrations into the night. So after a few hours in the dressing room, we, we sort of all went back to the hotel, met up with the families, and um, as I was getting ready, to go down onto the onto the boat onto Sydney Harbour, um, I saw there was a, a letter underneath my door, and so quickly opened it and, and read it. And it was a letter from JL, and he was he basically said in the letter that um, he's obviously retiring, um, and he couldn't think of a better person to pass on the leading of the team song to me uh, than me, and I was blown away. <laughs> 
absolutely blown away and um, extremely proud and honoured because you know it's a select few that have have sort of led the team song you know going back to the Rodney Marsh days and um, you know being passed down to you know through David Boone and Ian Healy and Ricky Ponting you know Justin Langer um, I couldn't even dream that my name would be on that sort of list of of people so um, yeah he I saw him downstairs as we were going to the boat and uh, he said don't say anything just yet we'll um, we're going to do the song on the on the Sydney Harbour and so we went out and continued our celebrations till quite late in the night <laughs> and um, JL sort of got us into a big huddle on the on the boat and uh, he dragged me into the middle of the uh, into the huddle and sort of said this is his last time that he's going to lead the team song and uh, I'm announcing tonight that this is going to be the, the first time that Huss is going to lead the team song so we arm in arm led the led the team song together and, and that's where he sort of ended and his reign and, and my reign sort of started and Oh, it was a fantastic experience, and um, oh, yeah, I felt very proud to have led the, the team song, you know, for the rest of my career. We played uh, Pakistan at the SCG in a Test match, and um, I remember on the first day the pitch was really green, and uh, it was overcast. There'd been rain around. The lights were on, and um, I remember Ricky going out to do the toss, and I, I said to one of the, the, my teammates, I said, "Oh." Surely he's going to bowl first today, and they said no. I think he's going to bat first. I said no, please, please bowl first today. The pitch is green; it's going to do everything. And um, Ricky, he doesn't care what the conditions are. He wants to bat first. He wants to get you know put the pressure on the opposition, get in there. And sure enough, he won the toss. And we're batting, <laughs> and um, we were bowled out very cheaply. I think we you know made 120 odd in the first innings, and Pakistan batted well past us, made over 300, and, and so we were. <laughs> We might be able to might be able to chance to win this test, you know. That's the my passion. And that motivated us in the middle. 
Uh, and so every run was just crucial. And, and we ended up getting, I think, a lead of about 170. I think that's one of the most rewarding things. When, when you play in innings that when your team's in trouble or you're under enormous pressure, and if you can work your way through that really tough situation with the help of one of your teammates um, and get your team into a position where you can, you know, you can actually win the match, that's what gives you the most rewarding feeling. When you go to bed that night, you, you put your head down and you think, wow, you know, that, that's something I can be really proud of. And, and that, that's how I felt after that ends. You know, we, we were under enormous pressure. We were behind in the test. With our partnership, we were able to get ourselves into a position to win, and, and we did win. He goes again, down the ground, could be out, he should be out, he is out. What a victory for Australia. That's one of the all-time great victories. Five wicket for Nathan Harris. Hussey, the match winner, but a good all-round performance. It was just a great, great feeling, and I remember sitting back with the guys afterwards, you know, in the SCG dressing rooms, having a beer after the game, and, and just feeling so proud that, you know, I've been part of, of, of an amazing comeback and a, and a great test win. Yeah, coming into the, that series, the Ashes series, return series in Australia was, well, that was probably one of the most challenging periods of my career, really. Um, I played a couple of Shield games. I think in, in, against South Australia, I got out for a duck and won. And then I came to Melbourne and um, uh, I got a duck in the first innings again. <laughs> and it seemed like the whole world thought that I was finished. I get him out of the team. We can't afford to have him in the Ashes. The Ashes is the biggest thing. And um, I was starting, oh, throughout that whole period, I got a zero, a zero, a one, whatever. I still believed I was good enough and I still believed I could do it. But no one else seemed to believe it, you know, in the periphery. But now, when everyone starts saying these things, you start to get these little doubts and thoughts in your mind, thinking, well, maybe I can't do this anymore. And I remember the night before uh, the second innings against Victoria, which is the, the last Shield game before the first test. So the test team hasn't been named at this stage. And um, I remember ringing home and, uh, and just saying, you know, uh, um, everyone in the world seems like, they've lost faith in me. Um, I said to my wife, you know, what do you reckon? Do you reckon I can still do this? Or, And she goes, no doubt, you can definitely still do this. And I said, oh, good. Cause she, I said, oh, I think I can. Um, but I think if you'd lost faith in me, then maybe I'd, maybe this time, maybe it's time to finish, you know, maybe, maybe I, I'm not good enough to do this anymore. And, um, but knowing that you've still got that faith, I've had that one person, I guess, that had that faith in me. I felt like, okay, no, I'm, I can, I can still do this. I think I can still do this. <laughs> so I went out the next day for Vic, uh, against Victoria, and um, yeah, the first I think the first ball I faced got a bit of an edge, and it sort of flew between gully and third slip and went away for four. And, and sometimes in the beginnings, you just need that little bit of luck to go your way. And um, I felt like I batted how I'd been wanting to bat, you know, and I felt like I batted really well and 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 managed to get a hundred and. Um, there was still no guarantee that I was going to be picked in the team, but I felt like I was going to be a good chance. And, and, and thankfully, the selectors showed faith in me and, and, and they did select me. So, but, the, but the problem is, you're coming into the Ashes series, even though I had got, you know, I finally got a score, that, that didn't take any more pressure off. That, you know, you had to score runs in the first test, otherwise the, the pressure would just, you know, be, be straight on you again. And um, I did feel like uh, under enormous pressure. And... I felt a bit disappointed in some of the past players because they know how hard the game is and they know the pressures that the players are on. And, um, and I remember, you know, um, Michael Slater, he, he was one that he was saying, nah, he's got to go. Mike Hussey's got to go. He's finished. Um, I think Usman Khawaja should come into the team. You know, he's ready to have a chance. And, and I remember watching this on TV and thinking, you know, bugger you, Michael Slater. <laughs> Um, and I, I remember I used that as motivation throughout that innings. Uh, Finn was bowling, and um, obviously he had his confidence up. He just got Simon Kadic out, caught and bowled. I came to the crease, and um, Michael Clark was at the other end, and, and um, he seemed a bit edgy, actually, and, and, uh, and I was obviously pretty nervous. <laughs> Mike Hussey at the crease. Pack slips field. He's not in great form. Finn to continue. Oh! Nearly caught. I remember, um, yeah, seeing the ball come out of his hand, seeing it pitched up, and I, I went to play a drive first ball, um, trying to hit it straight down the ground, and, and I remember getting the edge. Head spins around as quickly as anything, you know, wondering if you're going to get caught, and, and I remember Graham Swan diving low, and, and um, it was millimetres short. 
And I remember coming down to Michael Clark and, and uh, him saying, Huss, that was awesome. You know, great intent. You know, getting forward, looking to drive. That was great intent. You're showing that you're positive. And I was like, oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, you know. I'd just almost been out first ball. But it was, it was a perfect thing for him to say, you know. And, and it was important. You've got, to, you've got to try and stay confident. You've got to try and stay positive, stay positive in your frame of mind. And, and he helped me with that, for sure. I had that little bit of luck go my way, but I can honestly say every time I tapped my bat, I said, bugger you, Michael Slater. And, and that, was, that motivated me, you know, and I, I wanted to prove him wrong, and I wanted to prove everyone wrong. Another four, it's well played. Once I got my confidence going and I got a good score, I, I, wasn't, I didn't want to throw it away at all. I wanted to try and make the biggest score I possibly could, you know, um, just, just, just you know, prove, prove everyone wrong, I guess. And again, same ball, same shot. Same result. Oh, good shot. He's in good touch, Michael Hussey. Don't worry about that. And there's another pull shot. This time, Hussey gets it away. Again, we see him leaking on anything short. He doesn't look like a batsman who's playing for survival. Two men back, but that's uh, along the ground. That's going to take some stopping. He won't stop it. It's full. When are they going to learn? Hussey is murdering it. Everything that comes his way short. Oh yes, there it is. That's his off century. Very well played, Michael Hussey. Came out to, to bat today under pressure. Quite a few people of the view that uh, his place is in jeopardy. He's responded well. Great shot, beautifully played. Oh boy, that is Hussey at his very best. It was early the second, uh, the, the next day, I was on 80 odd and um, they'd taken the second new ball and Jimmy Anderson um, uh, got one to sort of nip back and uh, it went up uh, for the appeal and I was given out and the sort of referrals had sort of been around not, not for too long and sometimes you just get a gut feeling. Uh, and I thought oh, I might be going over and it, or it might be just pitching outside leg stump, I'm, I'm not sure, so I thought right, I'm going to refer it. And um, sure enough, I think it was just by a millimetre pitching outside leg stump, so I was, I was safe. And um, the English were really disappointed because they would bowled so well at the start of, that, start of that day with the second new ball. I think Brad Haddon and I were batting, they were beating the bat, they had that close LB shot, they had one given out, they were referred and, and then um, you know, overturned. And they deserved probably to get a few wickets, but we managed to scrap and fight and scrap our way through. And it was a crucial time in the game. Second new ball, if they could have got a couple of wickets, they could have bowled us out and, and been on top in the test match. But we managed to scrape our way through that tough second new ball period. You know, I enjoyed a brilliant partnership with Brad Haddon. You know, we, we both got hundreds and, and I think I got to um, my 100 just before Brad. And oh, I just felt so excited. You know, I punched one off uh, broad uh, through cover. And when I knew that, that you know I was going to get back to that second run for the 100, again, just emotion just started pouring out. It was, you know, bugger you, Michael Slater. And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I just felt like I'd proved all the doubters wrong. And, and I was just, yeah, so, so proud to score an Ashes 100, especially in the first test, in, in an important time in the test. The knockers are silenced. The Gabba crowd isn't. Back-to-back -back hundreds against England. Yeah, great hundred, and what a time to do it. What a fresh about his spot in the side. What a moment. Look at this. Look at him. Mr. Cricket pump. Couldn't contain that smile. The fist pump, and Brad Haddon's been a great support. Definitely, there's a fear of failure. Um, I, I, I'd say a lot of sports people out there would, would suffer from, from that, and, and I was certainly no, no different. Um, and I know in the Australian team, we often put on a really brave face and you know we'd act all confident and cocky sometimes and things like that but I know all the guys certainly had had it, that huge fear of failure one because you desperately wanted to be part of the Australian team and you didn't want to lose your place but also yeah we we're part of the Australian cricket team we're meant to be confident we're meant to be positive we're meant to be you know the best in the world and all this sort of stuff but but certainly um, everyone uh, suffered a little bit from that fear of failure and that that probably drove us on a little bit as well to make sure we were training you know just as hard as the next guy and, and competing as hard as we could out out in the middle and um, yeah so it certainly was a big driving driving force I think towards the end of my career I was just very comfortable with my game I, I I was very clear in my mind what I had to focus on my preparation was always excellent we in the Australian team you get looked after 
brilliantly. You know, the, the, the support staff that we have are all experts in their fields. They give you the best opportunity to, to give yourself the best chance to perform on the field. You know, um, you, you can, all aspects of your game can be catered for and trained, um, whether it be from the, the physio side of things, the, um, the recovery side of things, the fitness side of things, the diet side of things, the mental side of the game, and then obviously the, the actual cricket training side of things. Our trainings were phenomenal, you know, of very, very high standard. And um, it was a privilege to be part of the Australian team because you knew you were getting everything um, at your disposal to give you the best chance of performing out in the middle. I, I felt like I had great preparation, I had great routines, um, you know, before the game and during the game, and I also felt like my skills were in, in a good place, but most importantly, I felt mentally in a very good place. I felt like I had finally realised how to eliminate all those external distractions and just focus on what, what is important. And, and that takes time, you know, international cricket's not easy from a mental point of view. Um, so I was at a stage where I could relax because, you know, if I did get dropped or things didn't go well, well, you know, I'd, I'd played a lot of test cricket, you know, I, um, you know I, I just felt like mentally I was in a good place as in clear, clear mind, you know, I could just relax, just play, enjoy it. And when I get into that frame of mind, I feel like I was playing my, playing my best. I sort of struggled with my last few tours away. You know, when you're with the Australian team and you're, you're playing in all formats of the game, you're, up, you're away from home up to 10 or 11 months of the year. And that's extremely challenging. Particularly, I've got a young family at home. Uh, you just miss out on so much. And, and I remember um, having a three month tour away, and I don't know how I got through that. We've been through, you know, a whole tour of the West Indies, went to India, and, and, and then coming home, and you're home for a week, and then you're off on the next tour. And I, and I went away again for another two months. And on that second tour away, that two months, about halfway, I remember just waking up one morning and just thinking, I don't have to do this anymore, you know, um, I'm going to retire. And I rang home and I told my wife straight away and I said, um, I'm going to retire at the end of the Australian summer. Um, I don't want to go away on tour anymore. And because I'd had a look at the schedule and after the Australian summer, the, the team was going to India for four tests, then there was IPL, then it was straight to England and then a full tour of England and then back to India and the, the boys are going to be away for, I think, nine months at a time. And I thought, I really don't want to do that. Um, so I, I'd made my mind up before the Australian summer that I want to finish in Australia. I love playing the Australian summer. And then I want to stay home. <laughs> uh, so it was very clear in my mind. And I thought it's perfect because I can play the Australian summer, um, enjoy that, enjoy my last sort of hurrah in Australia, but then also just make sure because I don't want to sort of make the decision and then sort of regret it six months down the track. So it gave, it gave me the whole six months of, uh, of the Australian summer just to sort of make sure that, yeah, it, this is definitely what I want to do. And my wife kept asking me periodically throughout the summer, are you sure this is what you want to do? And I was like, yes, I, I, I don't want to go away for that amount of time anymore. And then I scored 100. And she said, are you sure you, you, know, you want to give this away? And I said, yes, I don't want to go away for this time anymore. <laughs> and then I scored another 100. <laughs> Are you sure you want to? <laughs> and I was very, you know, it was very clear in my mind. Um, the time away from home is that—that that was the killer. Um, I loved the cricket. And I loved the boys. I loved the contest out in the middle. I loved wearing that baggy green cap. But the boys had very tough tours to India. There was four Test matches in India, and then an Ashes series coming up. Tough, hard cricket. If you're not 100% committed to those challenges that are going to come up then you're not going to be doing the team any favours and you're not going to do yourself any favours. And I knew I was dreading those tours and I was dreading the time away from home. Rather than looking forward to those challenges and that time away and, you know, and, and the, the hard cricket and things like that, I was more dreading, dreading the pressure of that. And, and um, so it was very clear in my mind that it's 100% it's the, right, the right time and the right decision to make. This being my last test, I'll soak it up a little bit more than usual while playing it down as much as I can. What I'm really looking forward to is being with my teammates in those old rooms at the end of the game, enjoying their company and just being myself. Amy and the kids, Jasmine, Molly, 
William and little Oscar. They're here with me, by far my greatest achievements. Being nervous and proud, happy and sad, all at the very same time is a different feeling. But it's nice to have finally arrived here at the SCG for one last test match. Hussey runs to the middle. The crowd were ready for him. He was fast, but they were ready. Well, what an impactful 79 test Mike Hussey has had. The Sydney crowd just love him. Crowds all around Australia and the world the same. Ah, oh, yes, 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 Mr Hussey. Well done, Mike Hussey. An inspiring career. The 79 test comes to an end, respected by everyone. It hasn't been a long career, but gee, it's been full of energy. He's been a credit to himself and to Australia. This man will be missed.